everyone, and welcome back to our entrepreneurship video series on how to launch your new startup. I'm Marina Glassman. I'm a founder and contributing writer to Business Insider, Entrepreneur, Fast Company, and other publications. I'm back here with Sergio Monsalve, the founding partner at Roble Ventures and lecturer at Stanford University, where he teaches entrepreneurship and education technology and the future of work. Sergio is also the co-founder of the Entrepreneur in Residence program in EdTech at Stanford. Sergio's full background, the Roble Ventures investment thesis, and any articles and materials that we reference today are going to be linked below for further reading. So, Sergio, welcome back. Thanks, Marina. So exciting to have you back and to uh, have another great talk and uh, welcome prospective entrepreneurs. So, Sergio, in our last video, we left off building a fundamental understanding of your customers' pain points through empathy. We looked at tools like customer journey mapping and first principles questioning, among others. Today, we're moving from observing to building. So as we shift gears, is there an overarching concept that can be applied in starting to build any new venture? Yes, absolutely. So uh, in the previous video, like you said, the theme focused on how one can become an empathetic observer of your customer's journey is not just step into the shoes of the customer, but walk in them. Uh, throughout their journey. Uh, that's still a one-way relationship. You're getting to know your customer. But now what we're going to do is actually move that and evolve it by launching a product and essentially creating a two-way relationship, which makes it very exciting as the next step of the creation of your startup. Okay. And at a macro level, what are the milestones that define this product building phase? Well, what we're going to do is look at two basic stages of product creation and its initiation. Uh, first is uh, the creation of a prototype. This is a bare bones pretend product which allows you to uh, gain fast and cheap critical feedback from early adopters before you even start building a working prototype. Uh, then we go into the MVP, the minimal viable product, which essentially is your working prototype. That allows you to attract your earliest adopters, start engaging in them, uh, getting uh, feedback from them, start figuring out the willingness to actually pay for your product. And, uh, and you'll be able to build a two-way relationship to actually get the critical data that you need to iterate from that. Okay, so starting with the first one, Pretotype, you mentioned that this gets you quick and inexpensive feedback. People are probably more familiar with the term prototyping, so how are the two different? Well, this is a, a cool uh, word that uh, Pretotype was coined by an ex-Googler and also a Stanford professor uh, whose name is Alberto Savoia, and, is, and this is in his book that he wrote. Uh, it's called The Right It. Uh, we'll put a link below. In essence, a prototype is really a pretend non-working prototype that helps you your customers engage with. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, the prototype is meant to be cheap, is meant to be fast, is, you're meant to be uh, iterating on it until you find the right one uh, in the it, right? Hence the name of the book. This will increase your chances of success uh, once you decide to build your actual product type and your, your product that people will actually buy. So it's a very important step that is also is cheap and fast. And that's what's so important about it. It reduces failure rate. Okay. And uh, we've got an interesting example here up on the screen. Can you tell us what we're looking at? Yeah, this is a, a cool uh, Silicon Valley history lesson here. One of the very first versions of a prototype in Silicon Valley was the prototype of a Palm Pilot, which in many ways became somewhat of an inspiration for other great devices, including maybe the iPod and the iPhone eventually. Um, Jeff Hawkins himself was the founder of a Palm Pilot, which is basically an organizer uh, in the, I believe in the 80s. Uh, it was, he made a, a Palm Pilot out of wood, um, not, obviously not a working prototype, it's a prototype, uh, he carried it around with him to figure out in what parts of his life moments he would actually pull out the device and use it. And he would actually share it with others to get that same feedback so that he could essentially be walking in his own customer's shoes uh, and, and be able to then iterate on a few uh, product enhancements before he actually spent time building the actual product. Mm. So, and then in terms of actionable information, what are we able to learn from the prototyping and testing process? Yeah, so that's a good question. The first of all, it establishes a real and tangible conversation with your early customer, even if it's pretend. 
uh, you can gather data, not just opinions, but actual data, and that's very important. So there's three things that you should think about in this step. Um, this pre-dotype helps you just iron out, out little kinks in the product to fi figure out how customers would use it, right? Number two is it may help you prioritize certain features over others based on how you your customers are using it. Uh, and it helps you validate whether there's enough of a value proposition and at uh, the start of a real uh, engagement with their willingness to pay, which is very important. Uh, in fact, when you think about Kickstarter, it is the perfect uh, platform for you to actually put up a prototype, a pretend product. It's essentially a, a wireframe or, or sort of a, a non-working product that you put up and you put up a page and say, if I build you this, would you pay for it? And so that is the most amazing way uh, and a great platform for you to kind of use if you're launching something new and you want to validate whether customers would actually pay if you built it. Mm. Okay. And then the other step that you mentioned in the product development process is building the MVP, the minimum viable product. Can you explain what this is and what you achieved by building it? Yeah. So as you already uh, go through your iterations of a, of a sort of a very low budget uh, prototype, you then go into the minimal viable product. With this, this is where you actually build a working prototype, which may even be able to, to be sold to a special set of customers. The launch of an MVP is really the beginning of the formation of a two-way relationship that's ongoing because the customer is actually going to walk away with the product and be able to use it. Uh, call, I call this moment the time when the MVP gets some TLC. And no, I'm not talking about tender loving care, although that would be nice, but it is the minimal viable product meets your tolerant, leverageable customer, your TLC. Those are three very important terms that I'll go into more depth on Got it. So your TLCs, these are the people who are willing to tolerate even a subpar product just to alleviate the pain point they've been facing. Absolutely. Exactly. It's uh, in fact, your TLCs are arguably the, the real heroes of any startup. I think they are the most important set of customers you probably will ever get. Uh, they are your founding partners, essentially. These are your earliest adopters who have such deep need and excitement about your product that they will uh, tolerate the deficiencies of a, of a minimal viable product. They're, they're also leverageable because they are the trendsetters uh, who evangelize your product. They're influencers. They kind of drive the zeitgeist of, of the initiation uh, and people follow them. So they're very important to you. Makes sense. Um, I think I've probably used a number of products over the years that are not great, but definitely solved some essential part of a problem I was facing. Um, what would you say is a prominent example that you think exemplifies the MVP concept? Yeah, you know, it's and I've used many poor products as well. But in this case, uh, let me give you an example. Portable music. It's a great example in history. For years, people have been trying to figure out this uh, music on the go thing. In the 80s, we had the Sony Walkman, uh, which was actually featured in a Guardians of the Galaxy. After that, we had a portable CD player. Um, it had many issues. Uh, then we went on to MP3 players that had other set of issues. But, you know, in 2001, Steve Jobs came out with a revolutionizing product, which was the iPod. And so when he launched it, he understood he needed to solve the problems of the avid uh, music consumers. And this became one of the best MVPs, perhaps the best MVP ever created for one of the best products ever eventually created, which is the iPhone. So interesting that the predecessor to the iPhone was actually an iPod. Um, so, you know, now, obviously, this device does quite a bit, but what pain point was it originally designed to solve? Yeah, so Apple, uh, Apple listened to uh, people's frustrations with music um, and music on the go. And so there's three things that he, he was able to kind of, he shifted the game playing field. We talked about David versus Goliath. He created a whole new way to play in three ways. One is easy portability. You have the uh, ability to conveniently take your music with you without having to skip CDs or cassettes or all the crazy stuff that we had to do before that. Uh, he also innovated around the number of songs. So he was able to kind of put a thousand plus songs onto a little device like that. And that was great because you'd last for hours and hours and hours listening to music on the go. And then finally, it was he invented this little rot rotary 
uh, dial. So he had a really revolutionary way for you to kind of uh, pick your songs on genre, artist, uh, you know, or any way you wanted in a very fast way and with a very intuitive UI. And that together created a revolutionary product. Mm, if I remember correctly, the original iPod, though, was really not the most elegant product. I mean, it was clunky, it was slow, no Bluetooth, no Wi-Fi, no touchscreen. Um, you were forced to burn CDs and convert them to MP3s on your computer. I mean, this was not that easy to use. Exactly. And this is the point of the TLC versus the broader market, right? It's awful, but this is why um, early adopters, in the case of the iPod, it was music lovers. You wouldn't sell it to photographers or others because they didn't even have a camera, right? But they're willing to tolerate the flaws because they were music lovers and they loved that specific product. From there, you build onto more features and you conquer more market. But this beginning was so critical because the TLCs were critical to the beginning of eventually what became the iPhone. All right. So you launch your MVP and you get these trend setting early adopters on board. What does that mean for you? Um, well, uh, this is really a magical moment in a startup. Uh, the, some may think of this as the birth of your product. Some venture capitalists uh, will call this finding initial product market fit, which is a pretty important moment because it puts you in a different stage, right? So finding product market fit, you know, it's a term I hear a lot. I, I believe it's a venture capital milestone, but how significant is it really? Well, like I said, I'd love to say that you're done once you've kind of realized this. And don't get me wrong, you should celebrate this moment uh, when you actually are getting paid customers to give you feedback. The interaction of the MVP with your TLCs creates a perfect two-way relationship for you to continue to learn from your customers. You can measure, build uh, more ver better versions. Uh, you have that ability to now iterate. So it's a big, very big, big milestone, but it's just the beginning of a continuous iteration process that's going to be a continuous two-way relationship between your market and your product. So you really shouldn't take product market fit as important as it is, but you shouldn't take it as an indication that you've basically figured everything out. No, absolutely not. In fact, your TLCs uh, are so unique that the first thousand customers you get, those TLCs will likely not look anything like your next a thousand customers. So the uh, market evolves and changes in terms of needs. Uh, so keep listening, keep building, keep iterating, and don't make any assumptions based on opinions. You always use your primary data to make those next moves in your product. Okay. So there you have it. Um, in this video, to recap what we talked about, we covered prototyping, building your MVP, finding your TLCs, your tolerant, leverageable customers, reaching product market fit, which as it turns out is just the beginning. So on that note, Sergio, what do we have to look forward to in the next video? So, you know, now we're in a stage where uh, it's going to become pretty, pretty interesting, right? In the next video, we'll continue the startup evolution process and take one of the most important concepts for venture capital funding, which is understanding your broader market and how your product roadmap will evolve to conquer it. Okay. Well, thank you. And uh, that's a wrap for today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Please subscribe and please set up your alerts and then we'll I'll share the next video with you once it's ready. Thanks. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, everybody, and stay tuned.